What I've learned is that when you join an institution as a faculty and you stay there and you work, at the end there is a sense of fulfillment. There is a joy that it's very hard to describe. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. On today's episode, I'm so pleased to introduce you to Dr. Zara Malecki. Zara, welcome to the podcast, and why don't you tell people who you are and what you do here at Hopkins? Thank you so much, Kim, for having me today. I really appreciate your invitation. I'm Zara Malecki, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pathology at the Division of Cytopathology. I joined Johns Hopkins Medicine in 2007 and started my career as a full-time faculty here. In terms of my daily routine, in addition to my clinical work and taking care of our patients, I'm also training our residents, fellows. I work with undergrad students, medical students, teach to medical students, having lectures for trainees, and in addition to that, collaborating with other colleagues in different institutions and working with different pathology journals as a reviewer and also being part of their editorial board members. And of course, being engaged in different committee members in different societies. Oh my. So as usual, uh, more than a couple of things keeping you busy. Zara, I, I'm so pleased that you carved out some time to talk with me today because we're doing a special season that I've called the Triple H or the HHH, the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. Right. So what kinds of routines or habits or practices did you want to share with the podcast audience today? I think that's, that's actually uh, sounds like a wonderful plan in terms of, you know, giving a series of podcasts, because in real life, there are a lot of things going on in professional life. A lot of things are going in personal life. And there is only one person who can actually navigate all of, you know, different issues and different things in one day. And that would be only you and you. So the way that I look at it is that there are a lot of things and if you want to just go through the list of things that you want to do in one day, it just basically gives a headache. So <laughs> what are we going to do in terms of being productive and be ahead of the schedule and do our best? So I think it's extremely important. What I've learned over the years, planning, 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 mm-hmm. preparation, being very organized, and also being very well disciplined. I think those are the elements of success. Mm. But before even starting our habit and going through that, I think it's very important that just we would say, you know, whoever becomes a faculty, it's important to just remind ourselves that this is actually a mission, that it's not limited to our working hours or, you know, our office. It's just, it's with us. It's just part of our life. It's just part of me. So we go with that passion. We go with that positivity, that type of thinking process that we are here to change things for better. Mm. We are doing things for providing the best of the best of care to the patients. We are trying to train our trainees in a way that they become the future leaders. So we put those, you know, that type of focus in our mind with that type of mentality, then we start our planning. So everyone should have, of course, some sort of routine. So the way that it works for me is I start my day at the very beginning of the day just reviewing my plan just briefly so I know about my day plan. These are my hours of clinical work. Then I have this much time in between, maybe around that time. Then I'm just, you know, responding to those emails that can wait until, for example, uh, noon. Mm -hmm. And this is the time that I would review the papers. 
And everybody should have, have to have its own routine. So for me, the way that it works, I set aside some time at the evening and on weekends for reviewing papers for journals. So those are the time. And also, I have a designated place in my house. That's the place that I work. And also relatively in regular hours, if I want to work on reviewing papers, clinical hours, it's basically already scheduled and we follow those clinical schedules. And also, Kim, I think one thing that is important when it comes to clinical work is also about thinking about that this is a teamwork. We are a team and we want to make sure that our team always is basically very productive and we want to excel and working as a team is extremely important and when it comes to working with trainees there are sometimes that the schedule might a little bit changes based on sometimes we have teaching at the morning or residents might have teaching at the morning or they might have lectures i mean these days of course um it's through zoom but that type of flexibility is also part of the program for anyone. So even though we have our schedule, we stick to our schedule, but you want to just, you know, also keep that type of flexibility that, yes, the residents, they might have teaching today or they might have a lecture that they should attend or, you know, things like that. So it sounds like you are very high J in the Myers Briggs. You you like the the structure, the agenda, the calendar, the schedule. I'm hearing that you are really comfortable in a space where you have a plan. However, you also talked about the ability to be flexible and nimble and knowing that sometimes there there are some alterations or differences. I'm curious how you handle that walk that space between liking and enjoying and feeling comfortable and familiar with a schedule and a routine, but then some days when there aren't. Like, how do you flex your personal scholarship and your administrative work when you have that kind of varying calendar? So it's not every day like you're on an assembly line, you know, when we're in academic medicine. Right. It's a blessing and the curse. We don't punch in at eight and leave at five. So how do you manage, exactly. how do you cram or figure out all your work when you have that kind of varying responsibilities? That's a very good point. It depends. Sometimes it might be some hiccups on schedule that is unforeseen. I mean, let's say there might be an emergency for someone or the different things. So the way that it works for us, first of all, we try to just go with the schedule if it's possible and look at other options. It's very important to me that uh, reminding myself that there's always should be more than just plan A. There are other plans, yeah. plan B, plan C. <laughs> so going with different plans. Also, sometimes, yes, it may, let's see, for our clinical work, it might be just, you know, one hour delay because of other obligations or I should attend a meeting or maybe I should present something or there's an immediate need for something that somehow our schedule is going to be a little bit distracted. So the way it works, then we would say, okay, maybe instead of putting that part of work, I can work with another resident. Now, how about if I just see if the next resident is ready? Or maybe I can, for example, work on the, the other project, the research project that I have. Maybe this one hour would be good, you know, timing to look at that project. And you are trying to basically optimize your schedule and see how, you know, you can fill those, you know, maybe little gaps, maybe that email that was waiting for maybe one day, because sometimes people may ask for your opinion and you want to think about those uh, process. They want to see what you think. So it's not necessarily a yes or no. They, you want to come up with a plan. Maybe you can utilize your time for that type of email. So you try to see how you can use that extra time here and there. So I love the how you're describing. It sounds like a very comfortable space where you have figured out, again, the 
that balance between structure, organization, you talked about being planful, preparing, organized, disciplined, as well as being able to pivot when you need and being able to say, well, I've got a list of things. This is a hiccup, as you called it. I can just pivot or transition to that. So it sounds like you've got the multiple layers of plans, plan A through F or however many plans you have. And that sounds like you've You're comfortable in that space. I'm curious, when you mentioned earlier, I understand the importance of this, but it always makes me, I have bad memories of this, and you talked about teamwork. And what, I'm always curious how, I really admire people who are really, really good at building teams. One, My colleague, Barbara Fivush, the Senior Associate Dean for Women, she is masterful at building teams. And getting right. people to be productive. And I've always admire people who can do that because I can't do that. I'm not good at that. Um, when I've been so in teams, they've kind of happened organically and I'm always amazed that I feel so blessed to have such great team members, but I am not, I don't want to say a good team player, but I probably not. I get, I, I bet you a lot of team or colleagues would say I'm not a good team player because I, I'm so bossy and I always feel like I, I know the right way to do something. And then I get, you know, my, when I'm in the grip of my strengths, I get really, um, critical and I'm, I'm just hard driving and I feel, you know, like I've got a plan and I, and I have a schedule and I get annoyed with people when they don't meet their deadlines and, or they're, you know, they're, they're busy, they're busy, they're busy. And I always kind of, you know, roll my eyes in my head and think, well, who uh, isn't, who isn't busy? Of course we're busy. <laughs> you said you would do this. So how come you're not doing it or doing it poorly? So how do you, I don't want to say inspire or motivate, but how do you deal with people who aren't performing to optimally on that team? How do you manage that? Kim, I think. You mentioned a very important point when it comes to teamwork. I'm a big believer in accomplishing more when you are part of a team. There are certain things that you can do yourself, but on the other hand, when you are part of a team, that team can, you know, accomplish more. I think there there's certain ways when it comes to a teamwork. I think first of all, all members of a team they should become familiar with basically the agenda of that team and what we are going to do, what is going to be the outcome of being part of a team member. So, And I work with different actually teams. One is, for example, let's say when it comes to our clinical team. In our clinical team, the goal is providing an excellent care to our patients as pathologists. So our staff, our um, cytotechnologists, our colleagues, our residents, our fellows, we all work together. So just reminding them that everyone's work matters in terms of providing our patient care. Mm -hmm. So when the staff know that, yes, they are part of, you know, that type of teamwork. And also, I'm a big believer in respecting our colleagues and other stuff. So when we are part of a team, that type of respect and collegiality, I think that's extremely important. And also when it comes to kind of maybe deeper level of being part of a team, if they announce something, one of our team members that let's say something happens, something happy happens to one of our, you know, team members, let's say someone uh, receives a degree or someone's having a new baby, something that they, they announce and you uh, are aware of that, you know, positive or God forbid, if something, you know, someone gets sick, you just want to genuinely show that you care about your your uh, team member, whether you congratulate them, whether you just, you know, talk to them, even, even if it's for a few minutes few seconds. So you want to show them that actually you care and we are a team and we work together. And that applies to other, you know, teams. You can, you may collaborate with other institutions. And of course, that's a different level and a different format. But the principle is the same, that you respect them and you share your ideas with them. You listen to them and 
that's how we all learn from each other. Yeah, I I think that's really a a good reminder to start off with a celebrations and to take a moment to breathe and say, well, you know, here we are again, like in the the junior faculty leadership program, I always start right. off with what celebrations do we have? Did someone get a paper accepted or submitted or a grant or is there a baby been, you know, exactly. accept, a baby due is, is accepted or submitted or what's going on with the celebrating life? I, I know it exact, you know, it was my personality type again, so hard driving, getting things done, productive, check things off the list. I always want to go into doing mode rather than being mode. And so it's, right. I had to learn really, um, thoughtfully to, to pause, to stop before all these courses and seminars and workshops and even meetings and, and just to remember, okay, we're all human beings here, and especially during this COVID epidemic, it's, I think, even more important since we're not in rooms together at these Zoom meetings to just, like you said, take a moment to acknowledge the humanity in front of you because we all have stories and just pause, even if it's, uh, if it's not, there's nothing to celebrate at the moment or to grieve together, just to, just to stop and breathe and see each other and, just wait a second and realize, okay, here we are. Let's, um, we don't have to be so hard driving all the time. But you also said something that's very important is being genuine. And I think, you know, people know when you're being authentic and when it's coming from your heart that you truly do care about them. But I, I was, thanks for sharing that because I was just curious, you know, that sometimes we all have right. team members or people on the team who they quit a long time ago. They just never left. You know, I love that saying is, right. oh, that person, oh, they they quit years ago. They just never left. So that, that person who's so disengaged and, and it's so, it's a challenge to have a team member who is not on mission with you. And it, it's, it's a, it's a tough one. So the reminder that you said that you start off with, you know, let's remember why we're all here and we all share respect for each of our contributions. And it's so important to, that we need you. Um, if you're, if you're not stepping up, you know, we need to find out a way can, you can contribute or, you know, or as a, as a Jim Collins book, get, you know, get off the bus or get on a different bus. If you, if you truly don't have the heart for this work anymore, any thoughts about that? People who are, you know, maybe not in the right place or not doing their right. heart's work like you, you're clearly passionate, but what about someone? Have you ever come across someone who's not as passionate as you are, maybe misaligned? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good uh, you know question because sometimes uh, it happens that um, people may come to you and they say, you know what, I really think that uh, maybe I am more committed to other activities or I don't have time for this type of you know collaboration. I think you know being ready for. Getting that type of response is also part of our job. The more work we do, the more collaboration we have, the more likely would be that someone comes to you and say, you know what, Kim, we had wonderful time. We collaborated for two years, but right now I think I'm, you know, having different priorities or I'm just doing something different. And what I would say to our, especially in our trainees, when we start a project, when I propose a project to them, then I would say, how about you think about it? See if you like to carry this project for, you know, maybe for several months, because you should care. I mean, you should really think about that, um, whether it's a project or paper, any type of, you know, collaborative activities. When you care about that, you know, when you really think that, you know, publishing that paper is going to make a difference at any level, whether it's educational or, let's say, epidemiology, any type of, when you believe that your final work is going to address an issue that it hasn't been addressed before, then you take the, you know, responsibility, you go for it, you work hard. So I give them a few days. I say, think about it. If you are interested, mm. let's help, let me know. And then we start working together. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that is an important lesson that you just gave me that rather than being directive, you are being, you're inviting 
and and that that space that you are real obviously a really good mentor because you are inviting someone to get some space, physical space, mental space, think about it and then come back. So to me that implies choice and choice is important right. um when you, when you feel like you have no choice or no control, that's setting up a really bad situation for everybody but i i love that your mentoring style is one where you are Thank providing you. an opportunity you're not saying thou shalt do this rather you're saying here's something i think it's good but you think about it and you let me know so that's a, a really beautiful way of building relationships and collaborations in teams one thing that came i learned over the years is that communication is very very important how we communicate. And I've learned my lessons that anytime when something happens that is not necessarily desirable or it's um, something that requires maybe more follow-up, if we look at it deeply, then we will say, oh, you know what? Maybe there was a little bit of miscommunication. Maybe we should have talked about this in more depth. Maybe we should have evaluated this issue together, you know. So I think one of the important aspects of becoming a faculty is also working on that communication skill and um, how am I going to communicate with my colleagues, with my trainees, with, with our students, I mean, in general. And I want to take a moment here and mention something that has such a positive impact on my life. And that is, you mentioned about, about mentorship, which is extremely important and critical in our growth and in our accomplishments. Also, I would remind myself that I need my mentor too. Yeah. So that's very important that when it comes to mentorship, what I've learned that um, your mentor doesn't have to be from your department. Your mentor can be from other departments. Mm -hmm. And your mentor mm -hmm. also can be from other institutions. That's perfectly fine. Yes. Um, okay. So that mentorship gives you a lot of opportunities to learn about yourself and where you are standing. And they would assist you in terms of reaching your goals and getting closer to your mission. And... Also, they help you in terms of having better vision of where you want to be. And yes, things come from you, but having mentor on your side is extremely important. And one thing that, Kim, I want to mention, because you are part of actually our program for Office of Faculty Development, our Office of Faculty Development at Johns Hopkins Medicine, they offer a junior faculty leadership programs, and I'm sure that other institutions provide the same type of faculty development programs. And what I would recommend to my colleagues and also our junior faculty is that, you know, taking advantage of these, you know, opportunities, of these programs. I attended those leadership programs and I found them extremely helpful. We had wonderful speakers that, in terms of just a few examples, uh, how to be a good mentee, how to become a good mentor, how you have your critical conversation when it comes to difficult conversations. There, there are a lot of actually wonderful sessions that are offered, and I'm sure other institutions, they offer different programs for faculty development, and I think we should all take advantage of these fabulous programs. Yeah. So that's something I just wanted to remind everyone. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you as well that the challenge is I think a lot of faculty, when they get started, they're so busy with building their research career portfolio and building a clinical practice or building a lab and trying to find out what kind of administrative service they can be involved in and teaching and producing scholarship that the faculty development stuff they feel maybe these kind of soft science, soft offerings are, they're icing on the cake. And so they're understandably preoccupied with the very urgent, important things. And then 
I, I like the message that we try to impart through Office of Faculty and Office of Faculty Development and mentors that, okay, once you get yourself situated and you understand your schedule, your routine, your obligations, have a path, you would benefit by the collaborations, by the networking, by the content of the programming to build up skills of things we don't learn when we're in medical school and our doctoral programs, these kinds of self-awareness and emotional intelligence that we're never taught these things, but understanding and taking exactly. advantage of these opportunities will do nothing but amplify all the positive benefits. It's, it's Sometimes it's one of these little hidden gems that a lot of faculty members, I'll come across older faculty members and they'll say, geez, I wish we had this, I had this when I was a junior faculty member, that sometimes... Uh, you, know, you learn things a hard way, but if you were to have participated in a program, you know, maybe the content isn't exactly stimulating, but you're going to meet a lot of other people who are in the same position as you, just starting off, maybe with young families and children and trying to figure out how many invitations to go speak somewhere else when you're balancing childcare and all the same struggles and how to get promoted. So that encouragement and that reminder that you're not alone is so valuable in and of itself. Exactly. And also those type of programs provide the opportunity to meet other colleagues in addition to wonderful speakers that actually, despite the fact that they are so busy, they are so generous, generously, they come they probe, they give you all the experience that they have. Yeah. I mean, they share everything with you. And in addition, during those sessions, you also are introduced to other colleagues. So you can also, you know, share some thoughts and ideas. You just basically, and that's another, you know, benefit of uh, attending this type of sessions in general. And as you mentioned, sometimes that topic may not exactly what you need, but when you attend, that actually sheds light to other issues that you would say, okay, this is where I was. This is what I learned. If I just, you know, put this together, combine to these two ideas, that's the solution for my problem, for, you know, my next step. That's right. Yes. To, to me, it's a reminder of investing in yourself. And so dedicating some time regularly, whatever regular means to you, once a week, every couple of weeks to think about where you are and what is important to you and what will feed and nourish your soul and where, where maybe if you're honest with yourself, you talked about being genuine with others, but genuine with yourself. Have you identified any blind spots that maybe you have or some personality, you know, problems that maybe other people have brought to light that is a, is causing you some anxiety or worry, like what can I develop in myself that I'm finding this common denominator that I tend to always struggle with, whatever it is. And that, exactly. that self-reflection can really be, you know, it's obviously valuable, but it takes time to schedule that. So that mindfulness of recognizing there are resources, there are people, there are so many ways that we can engage acknowledging that that time spent on ourselves is not only good for ourselves, it's valuable in and of itself, but it has payoff and rewards for then how we lift up and elevate and work with other people. And also what I would like to mention is that, as you mentioned about ourselves, is that we as faculty members in general, we have a tendency to be perfectionists. We have a tendency to have higher standards. We have a tendency to be slightly obsessive compulsive. What I would learn that using those in our favor in terms of excelling what we are doing, in, in, um, using in terms of in uh, way of accomplishing more rather than just, you know, using them as just, you know, basically Sure, stuff. We want to use those as uh, in our advantage, and also at the um, what is important that the question is okay. We talked about all of these, you know, uh, publications, clinical work. I mean, attending different meetings, presentations. So, what is at the end for me? I mean, that 
sometimes that might be a question. Right. What I've learned is that when you join an institution as a faculty and you stay there and you work, at the end there is a sense of fulfillment. There is a joy that it's very hard to describe, but when you see your trainee starts the residency or fellowship with you at the end, when they become successful, when they go to different institutions, when you work on your presentation very hard and at the end you you receive an email or someone tells you, that was fantastic. I learned a lot. Yeah. I think those are those are moments of joy that that type of fulfillment and satisfaction is just so unique. It's so deep in your heart and your mind that gives you more positive vibe. It just makes you even more motivated that you have more energy to just, you know, keep going, keep going. And I think those are elements that are extremely important that, yes, there is a lot of dedication. You spend a lot of time on your mentorship and teaching and lectures. But at the end, there is a beautiful sense of joy at the end, which is extremely deep. And you cannot change it with anything else in this world. (laughs) I mean, that's, I think that's the ultimate. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Oh, that's beautiful. I love it. That's that's a a wonderful way to to end this series that this sense of fulfillment that when times get tough and the challenges pile up to remember those moments where you feel like ah, it was all worth it. That's what makes me feel good. I I'm doing what I was meant to do. I'm using the gifts that I've been given. And it feels so right and so fulfilling. That, that to me is the reminder. So thank you for reminding all of us why we do what we do. I've learned a lot from you, Zara. And friends out there, you've been learning from Dr. Zara Maleki here on the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you, Zara. Thank you so much, Kim, for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.